whenever a new king was born or a war was won, the empire would send out a herald to preach the gospel and to spread the euangelion, the good news, right? Yeah. Hence the next line we get from our text, a good news that will cause great joy. Now, this is not just <clears throat> any kind of joy. This is great joy. Yeah. The word great in the Greek is called what? Mega. Mega joy. In other words, they say good news that will cause mega joy. The word great is mega. Imagine the feeling that you get, maybe you have, when something you've been waiting for or wanting for some period of time, that out of the blue it just comes to pass, right? Or imagine the feeling if someone were to burst into our sanctuary with the Yuan Gilead of the good news that, hey, there's been a cure for all cancers and heart disease and memory loss and Alzheimer's disease. How would you feel? Mega joy. Mega joy. Mega joy. That's the idea behind the story. And mega joy. Great joy. That's that that's the whole idea. And now, and now <clears throat> the object of that mega joy is that there is a king. And if you have a king, then there must be a kingdom as well. Today, in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. <clears throat> he is the Messiah, the Lord. Did you notice that Yuan Gilead, the good news here is not you can go to heaven when you die. Now that'd be good news, wouldn't it? But that's not the good news here. Or you can be justified by grace through faith uh, without works, not by works. Well, that's good news, but it's not the good news here. You can be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Well, that's good news, but that's not the good news here. No, the gospel here is not about you. It's not about me. It's all about the long-awaited Messiah who has been born in Bethlehem, and that is the Yuan Gilead. That is the good news that brings mega joy. Amen. Amen. Can you feel it? Like the prophet said, and he is more than just a king. He is the Messiah, the Lord, the title used for God himself. And not only is he just any Lord, he is the Lord of all lords and the king of all kings. <coughs> this is more than just good news. It's mega news. And where there is a king, there is a kingdom. Now it's hard for us to understand this. We live in a 21st century American democracy, not in a 1st century Jewish monarchy. So this whole concept of the kingdom of God can be a foreign concept to us. But let me stretch out a biblical theology for just a few moments of the gospel of the kingdom and its simple parts. 1st century Jews divided history into two ages. And that is this age and the age to come. This age is marked by the rule of Satan, sin, and death. It has an epic of pain and suffering. And it's waiting for God to come into this world than to put everything back into its right order. The age to come will be marked by the rule of God. A time of peace and prosperity for all God's kingdom people. Isaiah speaks of it. He speaks of a time where a kingdom will be ruled by peace, where the lion will lay down with the lamb. And people will beat their plowshares into the ground, and there will be no more war. As the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 51, everlasting joy will crown their heads Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will, sighing will flee away. Isn't that wonderful? 
first century Jews were waiting for the Messiah, or in the Greek, the Logos, the word of Christ. Both words are used for the coming king who would usher in an age to come, or in other language, the kingdom of God and God's rule over all. The announcements of the angels is the gospel, the good news, the euangelion of the kingdom has arrived, is here. That Jesus, the long-awaited king, and he has now come to usher in the kingdom of God and to make it available for all who repent and believe. This is the euangelion. It's the mega joy. Why such mega joy? Well, did you notice in verse 10 that said the good news is for all people? Yes. Not just Jews, not just the wealthy, not just the well-connected, not just people who are good, but all <clears throat> who in Jesus' language that's used later in Scripture who repent and believe. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus, when he began his ministry, said, Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. In Mark's gospel, the first chapter, we have the recordings of the inspired summary of Jesus' message as he begins his ministry. And he says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. To repent and believe in the king, in the gospel for the kingdom of God has come near in Matthew. It is at hand in Mark and in Luke's gospel. Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom was coming. And he answered, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that you can observe. Nor will they say, look, here it is or look, there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. Amen. It's come near. Yes. It's at hand. It's among you. Thank you. It can be very confusing, can it? This kingdom business, the kingdom of God. Uh, what is it and where is it? Well, it is now and not yet. Can you wrap your brain around that just for a second? It is now and not yet. The kingdom was not what anyone expected in Jesus' day. What most Jews in the first century were expecting was a clear mind of demarcation between the age that was and the age that is to come. One age is over and a new age has begun. It didn't happen how they believed or how they hope, had hoped. But what actually happened was in Jesus' birth, listen, in his life, listen carefully, in his death, and resurrection and ascension, Jesus dragged the future into the present. The age to come is now in this age. In other words, Jesus opened a portal to the coming world. A way to live under God's room now as an advanced sign of what is yet to come for the whole world. In other words, the church, the aim of the church is to function as the vanguard of the social order that is coming. We represent the kingdom of God that is now but has not yet come in all of its fullness. Contrary to what we think in church history, the Advent season is less about Jesus' first coming, which is nice. I, I love the, the, the children and, and how wonderful it is them, for them to dress up and to reenact that play over again. But, but the Advent in our church's history has been less about that first coming and more of the Advent of his second coming. Fleming Rutledge and her a uh, wonderful Advent book writes about how Advent is just not a season on the church's calendar. It's the timber of our spiritual life. In a real sense, the Christian community lives in Advent all year round. It can well be called the time between. 
Because the people of God live in the time between the first coming and his second coming. He came incognito in the stable in Bethlehem. In his second coming, he will come in glory. The shout and the sound of a trumpet and the eastern sky will part. And the king of kings and the Lord of lords will come to judge the living and the dead. Hallelujah. Praise God. Remember, in the time between... Paul reminds us that during this time that our lives in Colossians chapter 3 are hidden in Christ, in God. Your life is hidden in Christ, in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, we shall also appear with him in glory. Advent contains within itself the crucial balance of the now and not yet that our faith requires. The disappointment and the brokenness and the suffering and the pain that characterizes much of our life in the now and the present world is held in dynamic tension with the promise of the future glory that is yet to come. It is in that advent tension that the church lives its life. This is us. Because we live in this age, we feel sorrow. Because we live in this age, we'll experience pain. But because we also live with the foot in the age to come, we can experience joy. Yes. Not sorrow or joy, mm. but it's sorrow and joy. Mm. Now, you may ask, and, and I'm closing with these words, if all of that is true, Pastor, why am I not experiencing mega joy? Remember, I asked you how many you have mega joy. About seven of you raised your hand. The other, I saw this smile on your face. Like you've been up to something, right? <laughs> well, it's been a hard year, hasn't it? We're all human, so stuff happens. We're fragile creatures. We're vulnerable. We experience pain, we suffer, and in the end, we die. If you're not at all chipper this Christmas, I could understand why. Because joy is really more than just an emotion. It's not based on the circumstances that we find ourselves in. The same is true of the other Advent themes that we light the candles of hope and peace and joy and love. All four of these are emotions. They, they're, they're more than emotions. They are an inner condition of the heart of Christ as we take them on in our hearts and as we apprentice or as we disciple ourselves and live in the kingdom that is now and not yet. But herein lies the key idea. Our relationship to joy isn't just passive. If you just are waiting around for joy to fall upon you, it's probably not going to happen. Joy is active. Joy isn't something we necessarily feel, but it's something that we choose. It's a deliberate decision to make joy in God, or in the language of the New Testament, to rejoice. Henry Nouwen said it this way, joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing joy each and every day. Richard Foster, who wrote wonderful novels, one on the celebration of discipline. I don't know if you've read it, please do. He said, the decision to set the mind on the higher things of life is an act of the will. That is why celebration is a discipline. It's not something that falls on our heads. 
It is the result of a consciously chosen way of thinking and living in Christ. Amen. Now, how do we do all this as we live? Hallelujah. In between the ages with a brain hardwired to focus on the bad. And how do we move from fear in this life to the shepherd's great joy, the text that we read. Well, I have a new Advent passage. I wanted to read these few verses to you, and then we're done. It comes from Philippians. This is an odd Advent, uh, place for an Advent passage of Scripture. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 8, and it says simply this, Rejoice! In the Lord. You hear that? That, that, that? That's a conscious decision to rejoice or to joy in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And I say it again because sometimes we're hard headed. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything to which our mind are hardwired to make us anxious about everything. Correct? Yes. <clears throat> With thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace, the shalom of God, will transcend all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ <clears throat> Jesus. Family, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. If you don't think that you have to wake up each and every day and put effort into doing that, and this somehow the Christian life of joy and peace and love and hope and all of these things is just going to fall on you or hit you upside of the head as uh, uh, Angie closes the car door on mine. <laughs> it's not going to happen until we find our joy in a relationship with the joy giver who the angels said, Rejoice, for in the city of David a Savior is born. He is the king, and he has a kingdom, and you're in that kingdom, and he is with you in that kingdom. It is not yet what it's going to be, but we look in anticipation and hope, and we fill our lives with joy. We fill our lives with his peace. We fill our lives with his hope, because he is our only hope, our only peace, our only joy, and our only love. And his name is Jesus. Amen. And he's the only one that can bring joy Hallelujah. to your life. Let us pray. Eternal God. We give you thanks. We give you praise for the great joy that we have in Christ our Lord. Help us, Lord, to rejoice in the Lord always, to rejoice. Help us not to be anxious about the season that we find ourselves in. We know, Lord, that we live in your kingdom. A kingdom that is now, but a kingdom that is not yet. So, Lord, we live in that tension Amen. of a people of God that experiences loss. Yes. But great hope. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> who experiences fear. But we hear, fear not, for I am with you. Amen. Who experiences pain. But one who says... I will walk with you in the course, the painful times of your life. We experience confusion and loss of hope. And he reminds us during this season of Advent 
that he indeed is our hope. And in him, we can put our trust. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Amen. Let's Amen. Sing together. Let's sing Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh,